Good evening, everyone. We will call the special city council meeting to order for July 31, 2012. And the purpose of this is to discuss the 2013 budget and our city council president chairs the meeting. So we'll, I'll no, now turn the gavel over to council president Bonnie Peterson and I will stay here during the hearings as well to answer any questions you might have. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Wright will be uh, absent tonight. Are we supposed to get a quorum? Do a, that for Charlene? Roll call. Roll call. <laughs> Lorente? Scott? Here. Wright? Clayton? Peterson? Here. Doyle? Here. Lewis? Oh, here. Roberts? Here. Sasso? Here. Nordstrom? Here. We have quorum. Thank you, Charlene. Um, one of the handouts that you have here tonight is uh, called Budget Review, uh, Tuesday, July 31st. And what I did was I took uh, the questions and, and answers that we've received so far and lined them up with the speakers that will be uh, speaking so that you can look um, and see what answers have already uh, occurred. And um, I would just remind you that this is, you're the board of directors of the, on the board of directors for the city, and we need to try to avoid micromanagement. And we want to, uh, there will be items that you will want to work on uh, but some solutions and changes won't occur inside this budget process. For instance, if you want to change the way something's done in a department, it will need to be done outside of this budget process. So, but we will keep a list of, of those things also that, are, uh, that you're interested in. And um, let's see, if you, we're going to take a break. Let's see. Well, whenever potentially, whenever the, um, let's see, supposedly at 645, we'll have a break. Um, that's scheduled, but we can always take one sooner if we need to. Do we have someone here for to do the invocation? For budget? Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, I think we're pretty much a kind of a study group. And I'm going to um, turn it over to Charity. She has uh, uh, some things she's put together, and then we'll see if you have any questions, and then we will invite Greta up when it's uh, time. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, give a very quick overview about the intent of tonight versus um, the, the rest of the budget hearings that we'll be having. And today is really the time to listen. It's the time to get input. It's the time to ask questions. I guarantee even after tonight, as the information we get kind of percolates for the next week and a half, we'll have other questions come up. And that's why the next budget hearing isn't scheduled until next Thursday. So that'll give us time to, to really formulate with clarity um, the things that, that we have on our minds. Uh, like, like Bonnie said, we'd really like to get away from uh, years past of real microscopic thinking. That's the job of our management. That's the job of our staff. Our job really needs to be the broader stroke of the city and, uh, you know, complement what our staff does as opposed to uh, repeat what our staff does. Um, today is also not about really finding solutions. I guess you can kind of think of it like a puzzle. Tonight we're going to really throw out a lot of the pieces. We're going to um, take a look at them over the next weeks study and strategize and figure out how they're best gonna gonna fit together so next week we'll really launch more rolling up our sleeves trying to find those solutions and uh, the course of tonight the questioning and, and the, the the topics of concern that come up will really guide how the future budget hearings go um, i'll be keeping a list of points that we want to consider major driving questions or problems that we feel we need to solve before this budget is ratified, keeping in mind that um, what Bonnie said is it's not our, 
uh, agenda to totally restructure how things are done. I mean, our options for ratifying a budget are funding or defunding, point blank. If there are other things, we can certainly talk about that. And, and we'll, we'll try to use some um, discrimination as that, as that goes along so we know what needs to be handled before we can ratify the budget versus what, what can be done after we ratify the budget. And those questions, you know, is this going to be a new process for all of us, um, a new, you know, form of budget? It's, it's kind of a fresh start for everybody. So um, don't hesitate to ask those questions. And uh, with that, I think we'll just, uh, actually, we could probably get started early. I'll turn it back over to you. Um, does anyone have a question right now or a comment? Pauline? I was just going to let the council know that this also will be different in the fact that um, we have told the department directors that, that there will be no formal presentations, that this is merely a time that they are going to be present so that you guys can ask them questions pertaining to their departments. We did not want them, the mayor and I had the conversation, we did not want them to have to be at every single budget meeting by chance that a question might be asked. So this is kind of their scheduled time for questions, but nothing formal will be done because with the format of this budget, this year with the budgeting for outcomes, a lot of what they typically would have presented is included in their indicators and things to look forward to and that type of thing. So uh, just to put that on the table now so you're not surprised when, when they're not giving presentations. Thank you, Pauline. Um, did you? Yeah, I just wanted to um, add to that. So we won't be making any motions tonight. It's just input. It's it's utilizing staff's time to the best of our ability. And again, you know, if someone's really on a roll and the information is of value and our eyes aren't glassing over, I say we, we utilize this time as much as we can, um, including questions. You know, really get that out. Start to feel comfortable. Um, no question is a dumb question today. Uh, just we'll keep track of everything. <laughs> Evidently, there's a dis uh, dissenting opinion over on that one. But um, we'll keep track of those things. And as they come up in the, in the coming week and a half, we'll just keep adding to that list until we know really what it is we need to tackle in the weeks to come. Thank you. Yes, and I also um, didn't know if uh, Mayor Quaker, if you wanted to make a few comments. I uh, applaud you for trying this uh, this new budgeting for outcomes because... Uh, it may not be perfect this year, but it's the way we should be going because we should be able to look and see if all our goals, everything, our budget lines up with our goals. And so that's very important um, to do that. Does anyone else have any questions or comments before we start? I want you to feel free. Uh, there's food in the caucus room. Feel free to go get some and eat. We don't want you having low blood sugar and acting out here in public. <laughs> I know we often forget that we're on camera, so we would hate for that to happen. And um, we are running a little early, and I see that Greta has come, but she may still need a few minutes to get her act together. Uh, but we're just... Uh, Greta, we're running ahead of schedule unlike what we usually do. So if you would like to, if you would like to. Madam Chair. Yes. If I might also preface this with, before the meeting, it was probably about 3.30, I sent out the summary of all the questions and the answers that I have compiled. I know mm -hmm. Bonnie had put together this as, in order of the, the speakers tonight, which is, is a good I thing to have. I, put them in here. I do have copies of the questions and answers if anybody from the media wants to, oh. to see those as okay. well. There are a couple budget books here for people to look at in hard copy. And uh, I know I, when I had spoken with Chad briefly at the, uh, the picnic for the employees, he commented that he he didn't basically that he couldn't didn't know what questions to ask because a lot of it was so condensed that he didn't know some of the specific things where he was looking and so I have also done a summary page breaking down what's all combined in this budget book for each of the subsections so I can hand those out to the council as well if that would be okay awesome thank you Pauline do you have those separate the summary um, from the questions uh, 
So I think I, I would like to see the summary. Uh, the questions you will have had emailed to you, so um, I mean, you're certainly welcome to have all the questions, and I tried to t take those and put them um, in this brief form format for align with what we're doing tonight. And I see here on our time that we have library, Greta Chapman et al. And I think that's very appropriate for a librarian to have an et al. with her. Um, what's gonna, I guess at this point, since you're figuring out the process, what would you prefer? Um, I know that you, there were a couple of questions that you had um, that have been forwarded to us. I guess we provided responses to those. Chair Ron Pettigrew, we're here. Sure. Is it hooked up? Sorry. Um, we do have information as well as far as statistics that are listed within the performance review budget um, information and in addition to that. So I guess I'll leave the floor open to what would be most advantageous with the 15 minutes that you've got. Okay. Um, as you see, there, there was a question, I think, um, Amanda, that you may have uh, asked. I'm not sure. I'm not, I can't remember exactly who asked all the questions to see if you need more uh, expansion on that. Does anyone have a question for Greta? Okay. Uh, Greta, if you want to spend a little bit of time, if there's something you feel is important for us to know. Sure. I'll probably ask um, Board Chair Jim Olson to come up and just speak in um, highlights to the program, to the indicators that are within your budget book. Um, we do have four indicators of which there um, are benchmarks included, and those indicators are directly linked to our strategic plan. Um, I'll also just send copies around of those as well. So I'll ask Jim to just um, hit some of the high points of those indicators, and then if you have any further questions, um, we can field those. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Greta. Good evening. In our uh, process as a board of trustees for the library, we have worked over the last number of years creating a uh, not only a mission statement, but we have a strategic plan which we use in our, in our making decisions about uh, the plans for the library and setting our annual goals and in setting our budget goals. And in doing so, we've found that uh, it's enabled the library to move ahead and really become a, uh, an active and busy uh, place in our community where we've, we've been very pleased with the results. I think in addition it's helped the library to get through uh, what's been kind of leaner times the last few years because we were doing advanced planning and as a result had made some decisions and some purchases that allowed the library to handle the expanded demand with, uh, without increasing the budget in the process. I think that, um, as, as you can see in what's been handed out, the, uh, our outcome-based indicators show that we are following our, our uh, strategic plan and our goals. Uh, we address the collections, the programs, and the facilities, all of which are critical to the operation of the library. Uh, these, are, uh, these are all items that, that need to be done on a regular basis or the library gets behind. We've, we've found that as a result of having a plan and having our goals, the measurement becomes a much, much easier process for us, and then as a result, the budgeting does too. Uh, 
we, our second one is to promote the awareness of the library and, and our information services as well as current projects and, and new activities. And I think this really speaks volumes about what's going on in the library. Uh, the responsiveness, uh, just look at the number of visits in 2011 and then in 2012 our target was a 5% increase and we're, uh, we're seeing every year growth in the use of the library because of the fact that the library has stayed up to date in the things that it provides to the community. Uh, we, have, we have a replacement cycle. We're on, we're on track with that. Uh, the community use of the, the public computer use continues to increase. Our materials circulated continue to increase. Our, mem our uh, library cards continue to increase. Uh, as we, we look at all of these things, we're really delighted that uh, these things are happening and that we are, have the ability to, to handle the increased demand. Uh, you know, when you, and the other thing that we do is we measure the library, our library, by libraries in communities of comparable sizes around the country. And it's interesting, we are doing more at a, at a more reasonable cost in almost everything that we can measure. Our circulation continues to go up. We have on average 68% higher circulation. We have on average a higher per capita usage, almost 50% um, higher than other libraries in similar communities. Uh, in in the last year, we had 389,413 city residents visit the library. So that tells you in a community this size that there are a lot of people that are not just using the library once a year, but are regularly using this facility. It, it equates out to over a thousand visits a day. And so the library between the, the main library downtown and north are busy places. In addition, we're looking at, as you know, opening up the east branch. That should open here uh, in the very near future. The target was August, but it looks like it's probably moving back a little bit because of delays on construction of some of the other parts of the, of the Western Dakota building out there. But uh, the library facilities are moving along well and uh, we would invite you to, when the opportunity arises, to come out and take a tour with us because it's going to be state-of-the-art in a number of ways and it, it is really a unique partnership that we have with the school district. Uh, and again, uh, a great opportunity for the city and the school to share resources. So we're excited about this. We're, uh, we're not... Uh, We've, we've planned very well for this where we hope that uh, we can continue without asking you for more money just because we're doing this because we have planned ahead for it. Okay, well, thank you. I know you have a, a great library and a great board because, boy, if we could all say we had uh, twice as many patrons as the national average, I mean, that by itself is very, uh, very impressive. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Nordstrom. Bonnie, just a, a, a general overview uh, question um, for Greta. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's Greta that you were present at the uh, budgeting for outcomes. Um, was there anything of, of interest uh, that in that report or that discussion phase that that drew some particular attention for you? I'm not sure I understand the question. Sure. The uh, budgeting out for outcome process that uh, we went through and did an exercise on this last In the last fall. nine months or so? Yes. So. Right. It, uh, is there anything that came up in that discussion that uh, struck you as an uh, item of interest? Uh, the, perhaps the line of questions, the just the general process and uh, your comfort level with the, the process itself? 
I would advocate that what it has been for um, the library and the board is taking the next level um, to the budgeting process. So um, in our case, because we've had a strategic plan for a number of years, it's taken what information has driven the costs um, throughout the course of time and put it into a context where I think not only for the trustees, but hopefully for the council as well, gives you a, takes a lot of complex information and puts it into some very concise indicators. Um, I've been involved in this level of budgeting in another time. <laughs> so to a certain degree, to me, it's taking things to the next level. Um, I think what will make a difference long term, and I know the mayor has that in mind as well, is what happens next and how the information becomes more refined and how it becomes more integrated into the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and I think we're off to a good start in that respect. So, and to Pauline's credit as well, um, between the mayor and finance, they have done their due diligence in bringing it to this point, and that has not been without its complications. Thank you, Greta. Uh, a couple, probably one or two more questions. Have you got it uh, divided out on the uh, uh, shared costs that we have with the, the county? Have you got that information? I was looking for it, and if I missed it, I apologize. I haven't seen it. You, you did not. Um, it is, you have not seen it because the pro, at this venture because the process for the contract, which is an ongoing contract, based on a formula of the percentage of library cards of, in the county um, attributed to the cost that, of the city, and that contract number is decided upon the budget that's approved by the city. So to decompress that, once the budget is approved by the council, the formula of 14.5% is calculated for the county's cost, and that approximately to be around $400,000. Um, so it's very much driven by the costs that the city occurs for the cost of library services. And that budget is adopted in January of every year. Uh, understand. Thank you. I um, appreciate the, the drilling down into it and getting the numbers out for me. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, and then um, one other part of this is the uh, um, uh, branch libraries that we have in existence now. We've got some more planned for the future, isn't? Is that correct? Yes, there is a design on paper um, for the west side of town at the West Middle School. And it is in um, design in the sense of on paper. There certainly would be a number of um, things that need to take place, including obviously discussion with uh, the West Side and the community as well. And so due to the number of projects that the school district is completing, that that particular project is on hold until they um, close on some other projects and then come back to the drawing table, look at the bond levels, look at the, the priority issues within the district, and then hopefully bring that, that conversation back to the table. And let me just also add on the contract with the county library services, um, the best way I can describe it to you is there is a prenuptial agreement. <laughs> and what that means is that um, if that contract should no longer exist, it will not affect the services to the city of Rapid City. So we are um, very clear about this relationship um, has good beginnings and it's in a good situation, but if the day should come when that's no longer the case, it will not affect the citizens of Rapid City. We don't have the funding intermingled. Thank you, Greta. I'll yield the floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Sasso. Thank you, Greta. Um, just one question, and I think this is probably a little bit more for uh, benefit of uh, council members. Uh, one of the things that um, you have listed is uh, maintain a replacement schedule for library furnishings and equipment uh, to for replacement. Uh, do you want to? Can you talk about that just for a moment and how you've done that? Um, sure. The, a couple of things, as in 
all departments have been impacted as well as the community at large with the economy. So things have been um, set aside that were due for replacement. And so that's why you see in our indicator 66 of a replacement cycle for 2012 and 75% for 2013 to come back up to the levels that we were prior. Um, we have programmed in everything from HVAC to carpeting or flooring to furniture, lighting. Um, I think those are probably the major components. Um, windows can get kind of spendy at time as well if they get um, damaged. So. At the downtown facility that's owned by the city, we have all of that programmed into a replacement cycle. Um, so that's what those indicators represent. We also have all of our technology programmed into a replacement cycle as well. Um, pretty much what you see is on, when we buy something, we plug it into a replacement cycle if, that is, is, if that's the case in fact, so that whatever we purchase, we sustain. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Mr. Laurenti. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Greta, I had a, just a question on technology. As you know, as, you know, we've talked, I think, when I first came on the council, and technology was one of the things we talked about and the evolution of that. My further question about that is, as part of your strategic um, looking forward with the library, its impact on the technology's impact on FTEs and your budget. Can you talk about that a little bit and how where that will go based on that? Sure. Again, um, as board chair Jim Olson talked about, we do comparable standards on an annual basis, and FTEs is is one of the standards that we take a look at, comparable to other um, cities of similar size. We are average. We don't have above or behind or below the numbers of FTEs that we have. But one of the things that we continue to do strategically is to maximize the use of technology, in particular when it comes to labor intensive processes. So uh, if I'm following the track that you're um, talking about, Councilman Lorende, it is when we went to add um, the East Branch, we didn't add staff. Part of that is because we have a working agreement with Western Dakota Tech to add a full-time student worker. That had to be in the agreement because we couldn't add a whole other facility and add all those hours and not increase the staffing, but at the same time, because of technology, it didn't have to be a high entry degree position. Um, in moving, we haven't added staff, I believe, I want to say, in 2008, when we added the North Branch, we did add an FTE. But we don't project at this point to add staff in the future because of what technology is doing. Um, we have four machines for self-checkout and self-check-in, and virtually that's two full-time FTE. And it's not to say that we're going to have machines replace all of staffing, but because of the way that library services are changing and evolving, and the support that we've received from the taxpayers and the council, our projections on FTE are to maintain what we have and to maximize the resources. Thank you very much. Uh, Pauline. Thank you, Madam Chair. I need to point out in the library budget, uh, when we took the interdepartmental charges back to 2011, I failed to deduct the charge from the energy plant to the library, and that was actually deducted in 2012 because the energy plant quit doing services for the library, so really that should be deducted as well. So when it comes time for the final budget, it will be $5,844 that will be reduced in the library's interdepartmental charges, and then the offset would be to the energy plant. So, uh, Can we keep it? <laughs> Just needed to ask. <laughs> that would be totally up to the council, but oh, I no, do want no. you to know that to be proper, because the energy plant is not providing any services, they really should not be getting charged for it. So that will be deducted from their from their budget on the interdepartmental charge side. We, we won't ask. We've had good support, and the mayor's put things. We had twenty five thousand um, dollars basically for recovery from the last three years. 
and the mayor put forward with um, the board as well $10,000 towards it. So we're only $15,000 behind over the last three years because part of that is we found 150, I shouldn't say found, we worked strategically um, with technology and found close to $150,000 that we no longer need due to that fact. So um, technology is king for us. We just continue to look in that, in that area. The other part I'll just simply say to in that respect is um, the change in the energy plant was because we put $15,000 worth of HVAC um, settings is the simplest way to say it and what used to be monitored by the, uh, the energy plant is now monitored through the facility's cell phone. Okay, thank you so much uh, Greta for your great leadership. Pauline, could you tell us again what that amount is, 5000 and $5,844. Things we're talking interdepartmental charges, something else that I would like to do between now and the final reading of the budget is to get rid of the, inter, um, the general fund to general fund interdepartmental charges. There was a concern that it would have an effect on our federal grants, but I've confirmed that with Cameron that no, it would not. And so that is basically at this point a paper shuffling. And so that will kind of streamline it a little bit. So when you get the final budget, if you look at the individual departments, the, the interdepartmental charges will change a little bit because of that. It may look like in total the budgets went up, but they all net together to be the same amount. So just to forewarn you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions before we move on to the airport? Okay, oh, yes. Mayor. Pauline, for the benefit of the council, could you summarize when you say a paper shuffle what, what the general fund to general fund interdepartmental charges meant for your office and why it's so important that we get rid of those? Give me a second if you would. <laughs> Okay, while she's getting those done, I'm just going to let um, Cameron know that he's going to be up here shortly so that we're running a little bit ahead of time right now, just so you're, just so you're aware. <laughs> okay, what Pauline. it would amount to is the first month of every year, we do specifically each line transaction, whether it's general fund to general fund or general fund to enterprise fund or whatever the schematic is. And then the monthly thereafter, we just do a lump sum for the total. But that first month, when we do general fund to general fund transactions, just in the general fund alone, that's 265 separate transactions. By getting rid of the general fund to general fund, it brings it down to 149 transactions. So. That saves Tracy some time. That's a month. A month. We do it the first month individually like that, but then we lump it together as a total per month charge after that. Just And we do that so that way we know for sure how that additional monthly charge is broken down. So this saves you approximately 100 transactions a month. Did I get that right? In January, it would, January. and then it would still be the same number of transactions in the in the following months, because we only do um, one for each cost center. Then, after that, we total all the charges and just do it one the one twelfth of it. Well, still saving a hundred transactions because you know when you make a mistake in one, then that takes about another ten hours to find the mistake. So, <laughs> so. That's good. Be a great time saver. Okay, uh, Cameron Humphreys. Uh, Cameron, we had put together our uh, here under the list. Uh, someone had asked questions uh, for you, and just going to ask anyone if they want further explanation or if you have any other questions for Cameron with the airport. 
And if you want to take a few minutes to, uh, yes, what your commonly asked questions are. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks to the council for uh, inviting uh, me down here to uh, talk about our budget. I want to introduce uh, Tony Broom, who's behind me. She did the yeoman's work of preparing this budget on behalf of the airport board and then have the airport board review it and then submit it to the mayor and the council uh, for approval. Um, a couple of things about the airport uh, that I would uh, bring uh, up is that the airport is a full enterprise fund. Uh, what that means is, is that we don't rely on any tax money uh, from the city uh, for the operations and maintenance of the airport. All of the funds for uh, handling the operations and maintenance of the airport is derived through rates and charges uh, for tenants and users of the airport. Uh, about half of our revenue uh, comes from uh, both the rental cars and the parking lot. So the vast majority of the revenue for the airport doesn't come from the airlines, actually. It comes from parking lot and, rev and uh, rental car revenue. Uh, the uh, airlines account for about a quarter of that. And then about another quarter of the operational budget comes from other rates and charges uh, for airport users. Annually, our operations and maintenance costs around $4 million. That's the budget that you have before you is close to $4 million. Uh, we're, we're not really looking for a big change in the O&M budget. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you uh, take out the wages and salaries and associated benefits out of it, we're actually down by about 4%. Uh, and that's by uh, just more efficient use of uh, of what we're doing out at the airport, both in our materials and our repairs and the like. We've been going through some changes at the airport to try to, uh, to make the airport more, more efficient and more effective. And, and, uh, and if you take salaries out of it, uh, we're, we're actually, uh, we've lowered our costs. On the capital side, the majority of the capital money that comes for improvements of the airport comes through federal grant programs. Uh, the, uh, the primary one is the Airport Improvement Program grant that is administered through the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. That grant is derived from airport and airline user fees. Uh, it's not out of the general tax fund, out of the U.S. Treasury. It's out of uh, uh, the uh, Aviation Trust Fund. Uh, that money is redistributed back to airports to help pay for improvements. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we just got a $2.3 uh, $2 million grant uh, for our uh, recent terminal remodel and expansion project. The other um, uh, main source of capital funding is through passenger facility charges. That's a, another federally uh, uh, managed uh, program, capital improvement program. And essentially what happens is, is that uh, when a passenger buys a ticket on an airline that's departing out of Rapid City, uh, 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 Three dollars and, or I'm sorry, four and a half dollars comes back uh, to the airport to help pay for capital improvement projects. Uh, occasionally, the city will uh, uh, step up and and help pay for capital improvement projects. Uh, noteworthy to that is recently uh, uh, the through the Vision 2012, or I'm sorry, the, yes, the Vision 2012 program. Uh, the airport was given three and a half million dollars for the uh, twenty and a half million dollar terminal remodel project. So that's kind of a basic overview of our budget. Okay, great. Uh, questions for Mr. Humphreys? Uh, Mr. Sasso? Yes. Just for, I think, the other uh, council members, uh, our cost for employment of passengers, uh, if you want to uh, just share kind of where we stack up against sure. other communities on that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, it's something that we can certainly as a community be proud of. Uh, one of the key indicators for airports around the nation for how efficient uh, they are is the cost per plane passenger. And the way that you derive that number is you essentially take the number of plane passengers and you divide that by how much it should cost to keep uh, the airfield uh, running. Um, our cost per plane passenger is around $4.50, uh, which is very, very low. Uh, average for uh, an airport, Rapid City Regional Airport size, is somewhere around $11.30 uh, for all airports, you know, including the, the large airports like Denver International, Minneapolis, and, and the like. Uh, you get northwards of $14.5 uh, per passenger. 
the airport is very, very efficient. The fact that we only employ 27 full-time employees and maintain the airfield top to bottom with those 27 employees and management uh, and manage it is a, a very efficient something that uh, we as a community can be proud of. Okay. Uh, anyone else, uh, Mr. Monte? Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Humphreys. If you could, then you kind of alluded to it, but uh, or you spoke a little bit about it. But the new expansions to the to the airport. How, what's your feel on the? Uh, the impact of the Euro and M budget there, um, and does your 2013 budget reflect those the needs and, and that type of thing with the new expansion? If you could, thank you for the question. Uh, we when we undertook the project to expand and, and remodel the terminal building, we took into uh, uh, into consideration uh, any increases in O and M. Uh, there is going to be some slight increases, but not uh, a lot. Uh, we actually. By reutilizing uh, the space that we had more efficiently, we, we only had to add 12,000 square feet uh, to the facility. Uh, it was at about uh, 88,000 square feet, so we're right up close to 100,000 square feet now. So we're only adding about 12,000 square feet to the facility, but pushing that facility out another 25 years. In addition to that, we put in more efficient window systems, lighting, uh, uh, faucets, uh, you know, the, the better quality uh, uh, and low flow uh, uh, faucets. And it's actually going to help us uh, to not increase our on M cost very much. And our 2013 budget that you have before you does uh, have that into consideration. Thank you very much. Hey, anyone else? Okay. Uh, Cameron, I have a question for you. You said you get about 50% of your revenue from rental cars and parking lot. That makes me think that it's very important that we protect that property around the airport. And I don't know where we are in those negotiations. Are we still talking about exchanging property there on whatever that road is, to the entry there? Is that still being discussed or...? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, as the council is aware that there is some property that the city owns uh, at the Wally Bynum site, uh, there is some discussions, uh, nothing firm at this point, of trading uh, some of that property for uh, property that, uh, uh, that Hanny Chaffee owns uh, adjacent to the airport uh, that would be prime uh, property for, um, for development for airport. And uh, we're currently discussing that. We don't, we don't have anything other than uh, in process. Right now what we're doing is we're actually getting um, uh, an assessment of the property, both properties, to determine their actual value. Uh, and then looking at, at what each one is valued and whether or not a trade would be uh, beneficial uh, to both parties. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Pauline. I actually feel like I should be over here during, during my time. So one of the questions was about our interdepartmental charges, and I appreciate that uh, concern that we only had the cost centers listed. And so Tracy did hand out a spreadsheet tonight that for the interdepartmental charges that had both the cost center number and the description of that so you know who's getting charged what. So that should, should help you with that determination. If you look in the finance budget for the general fund, that is strictly our finance office, 17.5 uh, FTEs on that. And so then if you, we have more budgets that we are responsible for under the other special revenue funds, that would be the RSVP program, which is a grant program. In 2011, the city did give them $20,000 from the general fund, and they also began applying for our community investment funds. And in 2011, they received $4,000 from that source as well, and then they are going to receive another $4,000 in 2012. Other than that, they fundraise their money or get grants both from the state and the feds. The other two are the bid districts. One is the hotel bid that the CVB gets the money the majority of the money for that, and we can discuss that further when the CVB is uh, actually here 
or at, they're supposed to be here on the 9th of August, and I did send an email out, and they are not able to, so they're going to try to make arrangements with you guys to visit with you. The other, and that budget, the whole budget, is about $1.3 million, and of that, approximately $1.2 million actually goes to the CVB for marketing purposes to try and bring either conventions here or visitors here. The downtown bid, the budget is $183,000. That, again, we keep 99% of the assessment. It is actually, the 2012 assessment is actually on the legal and finance agenda for tomorrow. So we're going to be doing that again for 2013. The city receives 1% of that revenue plus any in interest and penalties that are received to help with administration costs. And with that, if there are any other budget specific questions that you don't have answers to or some that you may want to get further explanation, I'd sure be happy to answer those. As you can see, I lumped a lot of questions under uh, Pauline's se uh, section there. To you can give us a minute to look. Oh, Mr. Nordstrom. Maybe not so much a budget question, but my, my major concern is for this this particular department is uh, space, and something that I'm concerned about in in uh, just having where do we put the people? And so some of the things that um, Pauline, I don't know if you're doing it now or are in progress of doing it, but uh, the, the space issue seems to be a a growing problem throughout the entire city hall, especially up here on the second floor, but down on the first floor. I'm, I'm, are we factoring in something for a, a square footage area for the finance department? There, quite honestly, in the location that we are in, there is no area in which we can grow unless we take over common areas or school district areas. We are at our capacity for the footprint that we have been given. I want to say back in 2008, there was a staffing study. You know, you talk about space. Back in 2008 when they did the staffing study, at that time it was determined that finance was actually, I think, either six or eight people short of similar-sized communities doing the similar-sized work. And we were able to add two positions, and so we're still short. I think it was eight back in 2008, and so we're still technically short six. We do manage to, to squeak by, and the conversation always turns to, even if we were given more employees, where do we put them? Because we are just blank out of space. Agreed, and I'm just bringing it to attention just to everyone so that um, it, it's not only in the finance department, but in some other areas of the city hall that we're, we're starting to outgrow the seams here. So just an awareness issue. Thank you, Pauline. That. Okay. Uh, Mr. Laurenti. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Pauline, if you could, and this is just a, a not knowing question, this is a rookie question. Can you tell me a little bit about the 2011 budget as far as the time frame for it to, for an audit to be completed there? And it, when is, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. That's good. The audit actually to meet all of our bond covenants has to be completed by September 30th, and that's also grant requirements. So the 2011 audit will be done by September 30th of this year. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hopefully sooner. Any other questions, comments? I would just say that our finance department is really the backbone of the city as far as keeping us on the straight and narrow and uh, appreciate the work that everyone does there and the solid advice that we seem to get. Amanda. Hi, Pauline. Um, just in passing, you had made mention that there might be a um, software upgrade coming up soon. Could you just expound on that a little bit? Do you foresee it being in the 2013 or do you think it's going to be out past 2013? Quite honestly, we have reinstituted a committee to look at our software package for the accounting and administration software. We have IFIS right now, and they will no longer support their 
system very shortly. They had told us at one time they'd quit at the end of 2011, then they said at the end of 2012, and, and so we're really not sure at this point when they will quit supporting it. They wanted us to just automatically move to their new product, and at the time, it was all in beta testing mode. And I don't, um, I'm not a big fan of being a test site, because we have our own problems when the software is supposed to work. And so this committee is getting together. We're actually meeting tomorrow, or to Thursday to discuss it again. We would like to have a selection made as far as what software we want to go with in the beginning of 2013. Realistically, it's going to take at least a year to implement it. You know, they may require some payments along the way. Uh, nothing is in the budget currently. We are estimating, and it's a total estimate at this time, about a half a million dollars for this software. IT has committed some funding out of their CIP budget, and the rest of the funding I have some ideas for. Um, I did not include it in this just because I don't know how quickly we'll get on it. I would love to say that I would have something in place by the end of 2013, but quite honestly, it's not realistic. And if we do implement a new software, the last time I want to do the implementation is either at the end of a year or the beginning of a year. We'll have to do it mid-year. So if we can't... I, I honestly, I see it being implemented in mid-2014, realistically. Thank you, Pauline. I just know from past experience, it will take a good 18 months because you'll have to run dual systems for a while just so that you can tweak it out. So um, the implement or the uh, down payment and stuff, if you are going to start that this year, though, they'll probably want a hefty sum right up front. So. And I'm hoping to draw that immediate need money from the IT CIP funds. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, I'm sure Pauline will feel free to ask you any questions <laughs> as we go along. And that Thanks. is fine, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready for Brett Limbaugh. Brett, this is how we keep our staff on their toes, being early for a change. Great. Um, we have um, any questions for Brett to start off with? Okay. Uh, Brett, maybe if you want to just kind of start with what you, common questions that you're asked or concerns that you have. Oh, okay. Um, what we might want to do is go over uh, our funding sources for the department. Uh, as you know, there are a lot of federal dollars that we take advantage of each year. So let me go over those uh, three uh, portions of the budget real quickly so you understand uh, how those operate. Um, we have a Historic Preservation uh, Commission uh, that uh, is funded, um, and uh, we're asking uh, that that budget will be $24,410 uh, in 2013. Uh, those dollars um, go to administrative costs. There are design guidelines that we're going to be working on. Uh, public ed education programs, um, and uh, our match for that is service hours. So uh, that 24,410 that's in that budget item is coming to us uh, from the outside, uh, and our, our staff will essentially be in turn providing the service hours to staff. Uh, the, we have a transportation planning budget. Uh, about 18.05 percent of that is the city's match. The remainder comes from uh, pass-through agreement, and then finally we have air quality. Uh, we have a 30% match that we uh, provide and 70% coming from the federal government. Um, we have two other budgets uh, that provide the remainder uh, of our funding. Those come from the general fund. We're looking at uh, budget items 207 and 204. Uh, well, we're looking to combine those two. In 2013, there's no reason for us to keep them in separate um, budgets, so we'll uh, go ahead and, and combine those next year's just to uh, just, uh, be a little bit easier to uh, decipher that information. So that's essentially where our budget is divided. Now, as far as how we staff, uh, we have three divisions. We have what is called uh, the Long Range Planning Division. Patsy Horton is the manager of that, and that takes care of, of uh, transportation planning and comprehensive planning. 
Uh, we have a current planning division, which uh, Vicki Fisher is the manager of, that handles the day-to-day -day, uh, zoning applications, subdivision applications, and so forth. Uh, finally, there's the building services division, and obviously that has uh, our building official, um, our uh, permit uh, technicians, as our uh, building inspectors and plans examiners. So very quickly, that's an overview of the department. Okay. Questions? Ms. Scott. Thank you. Just a real quick question. I know that there were some professional fees that were needed for the Big Sky. Is that also included in the 2013? You know, the vast majority of the legal fees that we needed for that case have been expended. And it's my understanding, and I'm not sure if uh, Wade can chime in on this or not, that we're nearly done with the Big Sky case. Mr. Nyberg? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> I'm sorry, wait. Uh, with respect to Big Sky, um, the uh, legal services, the, the dollars that we were uh, funding for that, um, we're getting some incidentals that are coming in right now, but for the most part, I think that that lawsuit has been settled, and uh, so we won't be carrying many monies over to the next year's budget for that. Yeah, as far as the bills, I think that's correct. I don't, I guess I don't know the status of, of a, a settlement at this point, but um, I think that's correct. Thank you. That's, I was only looking for a budgetary purpose at this time. So just to, as long as we don't know of any other legal fees that will be coming up in the 2013 period. No, we don't have any planned. That's all I was asking. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Or I'll cross our fingers. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom. Maybe just a general question. And again, uh, this comes back to interdepartmental charges or maybe even stretching it into the PILT payment in lieu of taxes. Um, Brett, we, uh, we, are you experiencing some interdepartmental charges that we should be looking at a little bit closer? Well, I don't think that there's anything uh, out of the normal. Uh, you know, we certainly have uh, the the base charges that all the other departments are getting <laughs> assessed. Um, whether or not I agree with that program, uh, I would say no. I don't think it's a good use of our time. Um, but uh, there's nothing out of the ordinary. Thank you, Bonnie. You know, maybe it's just something that we, we can take a little bit further look at in as down the road on this. Uh, for me, specifically on the PILT, I, the, I, PILT? the payment in lieu of taxes issue. So um, I thank Brett for reminding me about that. And okay, Pauline. Pauline is. Thank you, Madam Chair. Community Planning and Development Services actually does not get charged for the PILT taxes. Those are just basically for the enterprise funds that receive, you know, the fire service, police service, the tax is like, they're, they're a form of interdepartmental charge, but it's for the, in case you need the fire service, in case you need the police service, in case it snows and you need your street plowed in front of your business, that type of thing. So with them being in the general fund, there is nothing for them to be charged on the field. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, are you, um, just wanted to look in that for, yeah, just for all, PILT for the um, yeah. enterprise funds? Okay. True, true. Yeah, and I, and Totally understand that uh, the uh, uh, general funds sl slash the enterprise funds are the only ones that are in the PILT. So I, I do understand that part of it, but I just it, as a general yeah. overview yeah. of the whole process, and I want to thank Brett for reminding me of that question. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Sasso? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a quick question, and I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head, and I'm not coming up with it, but uh, the comprehensive plan that looking at redoing, what are we looking at as far as the price tag on that again and then funding for that? Okay. Um, we're asking for $100,000 in the 2013 budget to be brought forward. Uh, Council just recently transferred $15,000 in the parks budget for the parks portion of that comprehensive plan. Um, as part of the transportation federal dollars that come in, obviously there are transportation elements within the comprehensive plan, so we'll be looking to add dollars um, 
to the 115 that uh, we would like to reserve. Um, our, what we want to do is somewhere, be somewhere within the range of about 200 to $250,000 uh, in order to get a consultant to commit to essentially a one and a half to two year process to get that done. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, thank you, Mr. Limbaugh. Um, um, police, Steve Allender. Uh, does anyone have questions uh, for the police chief? <coughs> we have kind of the question and answers that were you'd given earlier on our sheet here. So, and if no one has questions right off the bat, okay. So you want to tell us uh, what your concerns or highlights that you want to give us? Yeah, I have. Uh, I think of the questions that I've received from the council best way I can really sum them up and uh, tell you what I need to tell you is with a few short uh, slides. Okay. Um, some of the questions that I think are most important is uh, questions about staffing, uh, workload, that sort of thing. So first of all, I'll just show you this real briefly. Uh, crime is going up in Rapid City and I don't have a real good handle on exactly why but the fact is it's going up. And over this seven-year period, uh, I'm cutting off the bottom of the slide here, but it's burglary, motor vehicle theft, and, uh, and something else. <laughs> it's the, made it's this, the so. purple one. It's the one we want to know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, property crime is going up uh, in, in just about all categories. Um, also, violent crimes are going up. Um, uh, the one that's the most disturbing, I think, is in the purple. It's aggravated assault. If you look back to 2005, uh, we had 160, and in 2011, we had 280. And this isn't just a matter of us writing the report differently or classifying crimes differently. This is after our reports have been scrutinized by the federal government and classified according to their standards. So it's all a very uniform process but violent crime is going up. The uh, rapes are quite disturbing from 58 in 2005 to 103 in 2011. And so I'm showing you these things just to show you that these are symptoms. Uh, next, I'll show you the calls for service. Um, the calls for service are going up uh, uh, on, the, on the calls initiated by the public uh, in the red. You can see in 2007, we're just over 60,000, and then 2011, we're about at 87,000. Now, these are calls, these red calls are the calls where a citizen picks up a phone and calls and requests service from us, either on the 911 line or the uh, non-emergency line. These are calls we respond to. The officer-initiated calls are the one that's most telling to me because we intend, with new programs and new initiatives, this is our proactive work. This is where we measure our competitive advantage on the criminal and on the crime rate itself. So we're up and down all across the board. We're, we're just floundering here in the use of our officer-initiated calls, our, our discretionary time. And what I believe from talking to the officers and looking at the statistics, our discretionary time is, is dwindling. So our workload's going up based on increased crime and increased calls for service. Now, I work up a little ratio here um, to uh, show you how we're staffed. Uh, I'm, we measured police officers per 100 or per 1,000 citizens. And Rapid City is staffed at 1.69 officers for every 1,000 citizens, where the national average is 1.8. Uh, and 1.8 assumes an average workload, average crime, uh, average calls for service. But we find some agencies are commonly 2.0 to 2.5. So what does this mean? It means that to achieve 1.8, and that is the national average, we would need to add seven FTEs today. And, and, I'll, and as you know, if you've been looking over the materials, and I assume you have, we've been adding officers just about as often as we could through grants. And that's, about, that's the only way we've really uh, even requested FTEs is through grants. Some of those grants are coming due now, and the city is assuming the bills. So what I'm really doing here is two things. I'm telling you today, why, why it's important for us to keep the 
grant officers that, that are now being funded fully by the city and that in the future we're going to have to do something to, uh, to get our, our workload uh, worker ratio in check. So we'd have to add seven today. To achieve a 2.0 for 1,000 citizens, we'd need to add 21 police officers today. So I'm, so I'm talking uh, uh, adding seven, just to add seven, that those seven and their workload may require, it's possible that could require one additional support person. But uh, on the other end of the spectrum, to achieve a 2.0 and bring on 21 police officers, that is going to require about another five additional uh, support personnel of some sort uh, because these people make their own work and they, they create the need for support services within the agency. So um, factors that should influence this ratio are the population change. And in Rapid City, we've been slowly creeping up in population every year. And the crime rate, which occurs to me to be higher than average. Uh, so crime rate versus workload. Uh, this is a unofficial, uh, self-made statistical analysis right here. I'm not going to vouch for the scientific nature of it, but it's a good illustration for you. The Rapid City police staffing is 44% of that of Sioux Falls PD. And we're talking police officer positions. We are 44% the size of Sioux Falls PD. So if we were to have a comparable workload that they do in Sioux Falls, we would have 44% of the crime and 44% of the calls for service. If everything, all things equal, everything we have would be 44% the size of Sioux Falls. So um, I just used this one here. This is a self-initiated arrest generally, but I used it because it's close to 44%. Rapid City has 50% of the DUI arrests of Sioux Falls. So we have half the DUI arrests, but we have less than half of the staff. So this actually represents a 6% increase in workload. Do you see, you get my drift on this, what I'm trying to illustrate? So um, that's, that's on uh, DUIs. We have 57% of the motor vehicle thefts. So now we're up to a 13% increased workload. And a motor vehicle theft, that work involves, uh, as you can imagine, taking that report, taking measures to locate the vehicle, arresting and prosecuting uh, the offenders, and so on. We have 78% of the robberies of Sioux Falls. We have 92% of the rapes. And we have 108% of the aggravated assaults. We actually have more numbers of aggravated assaults in Rapid City than we do in Sioux Falls. Now, I don't say this to tell you that Sioux Falls is lazy or doing anything wrong. I think we all envy, you know, our department envies Sioux Falls and, and the workload that they have. I called the chief and talked to him about this, and he said it would be nice to have more, but they can't complain. They have a fair workload. So I'm just illustrating that our officers are, are working hard, and I believe now, and, and honestly, this evidence has just come together in the last couple of weeks, uh, I think the evidence points to the fact that we've reached our saturation point and we're starting to lose the one thing that's so precious to us in providing service to the community and that is discretionary time, a time where the police officer is free from a call and can go initiate a contact at a citizen's house, can check on something that wouldn't normally be checked on and so on. And when we lose that, we're, we're going to be in a big you know, uh, problem. So, uh, and I, I don't say this next part to be sarcastic at all, although if you know me, you, think, you might think that. But what, what, what we need here is a multi-year staffing plan because I think we have, we have done a lot with the use of grants and we should use grants occasionally, sparingly. Um, my position is to get us out of hawk now with the federal government before we start more rounds of grants. The uh, compliance issues and the paperwork and the and the multiple officers coming off of grant funding all at once, I think, is uh, a little confusing and uh, awkward. So we need a multi-year staffing plan. Uh, it, it can't be put off forever. We'll see bad results if we uh, put this off. And there's an alternative, and I'm not being sarcastic about this, but the alternative to staffing up to meet the need is to cut services. And they would be services such as these. We haven't analyzed these specific calls, but it would be these things that we might put in the nice to do category 
or less than absolutely essential category. So, um, and honestly, we don't want to do that, and I don't believe anybody wants to do that, uh, the citizen or the uh, governing officials. So, that's it. Well, Chief, you've gotten our attention. We've got a lot of questions here. Uh, Alderman Nordstrom. I'm, <laughs> I'm just one of those curious people, if you will. Uh, I'm the one that generated the question about all the uh, grant funding uh, staffing positions, and I want to thank uh, the, the staff people that put this report together, and I haven't had a chance to drill down into it very deeply, but uh, this, not, this department was the primary concern of uh, the grant funding for the, um, I believe it's called the COPS program, and uh, yes, the uh, COPS hiring grant program. And when those grants are ending and when when, and what we will have to do for replacements or if we do go that direction and how we're going to fund those staffing positions. So um, hopefully I'll get, uh, be allowed to get, get drill down into this a little bit farther and we'll come, I'd like to come back with some more questions later on the, the grant positions. About uh, for the police department or for everyone? For everyone that's been in this report. I don't know if you've got it in front of you, but essentially it's this mm -hmm. report here. It's quite lengthy and, and uh, the personnel put it together and, and I just need to take a little bit okay. deeper look at it. Here, you want to put that on the list about the... You're wanting to look, you have... Um, There's, there is quite an extensive about list. about the grants to Yeah, look grant for funded it. positions. Um, I, the, uh, my original question is how many do we have that are in this situation mm -hmm. and there's a report here yeah, with that data yeah and okay. i okay. i just got this information tonight so i okay. need a little more time to okay. if Great. i can study it mr roberts thank you madam chairman steve how are you tonight good i know how good you are with facts and figures and statistics so i wanted to ask you on these ag assaults how many are repeat offenders or do you know? I don't know specifically how many of those are repeat offenders. Is there any way we could get that information just out of curiosity more than anything, I guess? But I know from my position of seeing the same people over and over and over and over again for many years that I honestly believe that some of our some of the ways to curb these problems are enforcing some of the punishing people for doing the crimes. I think that that's going to come hopefully to fruition after the first of the year with a new state's attorney. I'm hoping that we actually give some of these people a little bit of time for doing some of these crimes. So anyway, if you could get those stats, I'd love it. If you can't, I can understand that too. So, thank you, Steve. Okay. Okay, let's repeat. <coughs> repeat offenders. Repeat offenders. Is that what you're saying? Okay, uh, Alderman Lewis. Uh, thank you, Chief Hollander. Quick question for you, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but how do you foresee uh, if we if we would go ahead and uh, take the mayor's recommendation of not not taking CPI this year or 2010, 2013, 12? Excuse me. Uh, how do you see that affecting your department and? your ability to police the city? Well, I, I believe I'm just sounding a warning tonight. I'm not coming to you telling you we have an emergency staffing issue that has to be dealt with right now. My, my concern is that uh, when we, if we push this off for many more years, oops, <laughs> many more years, <laughs> that it will become a crisis. Um, but uh, the question is, you know, when to start it and how to start it. And I haven't drafted a, a staffing plan. But I can tell you for the last five years we've done everything we can do, everything we know how to do to make better use of the personnel we do have. We have stopped some functions that uh, soaked up a bunch of uh, employee time. We've put uh, as many resources back uh, in patrol cars and on the road as we possibly could. And, um, so, uh, so anyway, we're prepared to 
police this city in 2013 on the budget that you have in front of you. Um, but I think uh, we're going to need some help after that. Oh, Alderman Sasso. The animal service calls, uh, how much do you guys, would you miss them if we were able to figure out how to get the Humane Society to take over or? <laughs> If, if you could do that, you'd be elected the new police chief. <laughs> well, we wouldn't miss them, but, uh, you know, realistically, there is a major issue with handling these calls around the clock, 24 hours, and um, bad enough during the day, but at, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning when we have them. Um, well, I'll, just, I'll have to be honest, from about uh, noon or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, these type of calls are holding for 30, 40, 50 minutes routinely, and that wears on the uh, complaining parties a little bit. But we, we, do need to, we do need a better solution for animal calls, but we also need a better solution for a lot of calls such, like animal calls, similar to animal calls. Just, uh, just knowing that's something the Humane Society, I think they've thought about if they can get the funding to be able to provide 24-7 uh, and just thinking that that might be a little more cost effective and uh, help help you out just a little bit even though I think you I, you might miss some of those maybe maybe just a little but okay thank you. Alderman Laurenti. Thank you Madam Chair. Chief if you would uh, one, one of the questions in the handout that we have from some of the questions that you feel that there were some a table that was provided for uh, turnover and I wanted to ask you in light of some of the conversation that you've had already with us on um, workload what's your sense of the workload and its impact on turnover well that's an excellent question because um, like it or not when an employee leaves um, he or she is slightly worried about the recommendation the employer he's leaving will give him. So they're very, they're very polite in their exit interviews. So we get a different story in the hallways than we do at Human Resources. But in the hallways, they leave because of wages and benefits and uh, workload. Uh, on paper, they leave for better opportunity for their family or get closer to family or whatever. So it's really hard to analyze it from my level at least. But I can tell you that for uh, 27 years I've been here, the number one complaint from the cop on the street is uh, being staffed too lightly. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Alderman Lewis. Thank you again. So, uh, Chief, excuse me, going back kind of to my original question, how much do you have any ballpark figures or numbers for us on how much it would cost us to get to, you know, the full-time employees that we've talked about with your plan? Do you have, have you worked on those numbers yet? Well, roughly, um, uh, to add seven FTEs today to get up to the national average would be around $350,000 in wages and benefits to start with. And approximately another uh, twenty to twenty-five thousand in equipment. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, Ms. Scott. Hi, Chief. Uh, on the twenty thirteen budget, does it already include the um, city picking up the grant money that's going out? The officers, the FTEs that. Yes, all the. All of the employees, even the ones that have been defunded beginning in January of 2013, are in the budget. Uh, they're all accounted for. So our budget looks very similar to other years, but the revenue, our projected revenue is down. All right. And um, what's the pro projection of the grant money for the FTEs running at? Is it over a five-year period? Is it phased out, like, pretty evenly, or? The typical arrangement for the police officer hiring grants that we get is we get a, a percentage of funding. Lately it's been 100% of, of the funding for three years. 
and the city is required to pick up the funding for the fourth year and then there are no strings attached for the fifth year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clayton. Chief, uh, I'd like to know, based on this need for further officers um, and, and where we sit in terms of the national average, has that impacted at all the reaction time uh, when there's calls for backup? Um, calls for backup, no. Uh, officers will drop whatever they're doing uh, and and uh, back up the other officers. It, it has perhaps um, caused a slight delay in the uh, responding time on run-of-the-mill calls for service, but no, it's hard to uh, it's hard to say that the staffing level hurts the officers' uh, available backup. It's hard to. I think you could. I think you could get a yes vote on that from one of the guys or one or two of the guys on night shift. But um, it, you know, it may be in an instance. I mean, we we have them where, and these are just occasionally where, an officer will call for help, but everyone else who called for help first has a more pressing situation. But we do have good support from the uh, uh, Pennington County Sheriff and the. Uh, Highway Patrol as well that are in town. Well, it, it sounds like what you're alluding to is as we become short-staffed, if I could use that term, that our police department becomes more reactive rather than proactive, and that proactivity begins to diminish to the point of disappearing. And it would only take one instance of a need for backup that doesn't arrive in time or it's just not suitable and then we as a community have placed you and and your team in jeopardy well that's a that's certainly a possibility um, and I guess you'd have to do a ride along to see how this works in real time but the uh, the chief complaint of the police officer is not that he can't get help it's that when he arrives at that call he's by himself and he doesn't feel comfortable to, but he knows everyone else is busy, so he goes by himself anyway. And that's the that's the, probably the biggest threat to the officer's safety. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is kind of a staffing level question as well, Chief. If you got an uh, have you got an update for us on the canine unit? Uh, we have three canines, uh, three canine units up and running, um, and uh, they're all trained and certified. I was just curious, uh, maybe a couple of components to that question would be the, the cost of one of those uh, dogs, and then uh, are we getting to the point where we need a, a fourth, uh, fourth unit? That's a good question. The canine officer is, is slightly limited on the type of calls uh, for service that he will respond to or can respond to. He can't transport prisoners in his car if he wants them to remain intact. <laughs> <laughs> and those officers are slightly more uh, expensive because these, these dogs are, are very expensive to maintain. So, um, you know, we, we have currently three canine units and we're paying the price of having about four police officers. So we've, give, you know, on paper, really, you could say we've given up a police officer position so that we could have these three canines. So again, uh, we considered uh, reducing the canines. We went through a trial period, and and it was uh, only then that we really got to see the uh, value of these canine units. So it's possible. It's a, you know, it's a balance. We're in the business to try to find the balance between having someone who can handle 1,800 calls for service in his, in his year to where maybe a canine will handle uh, half or two-thirds of that or something of that nature. So it's a balance, but something that would, you know, uh, sure they would love to uh, analyze. Thank you. I'll yield the floor. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Um, I have a question for you, Chief. Um, you had mentioned the misdemeanor crimes about possibly not 
go into those? Like what type of crimes are misdemeanor crimes? Thefts and vandalisms and um, trespassing and minor crimes of that nature. And I, and I put that up there. That's probably the most drastic of all the examples I put up there because mm -hmm. we see them, we see departments doing that, but they're, but they're cities like Oakland. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is really a black mark on the city when that type of thing happens. Okay. And when you had said seven, you're, talk, you're talking about keeping the four, the ones from the federal grants, and then adding seven. Correct. Is that, okay. And I know um, Brian had sent an email today about uh, Rapid City being in the t number 10 on um, best small cities for aging, but Sioux Falls was number one, and they mentioned their high uh, economy and, uh, um, you know, so it's not, you know, crime is related to jobs, and I mean, you know, it's a vicious uh, cycle of, things that we need to try to, to do. Um, okay. I wanted to tell you that my, a man walked in my neighbor's back door the other night, walked through her house, and when he saw her, he started running, trying to get out the front door. <laughs> but anyway, so the, I called the police, and uh, they did come, which was good, but they looked like they were 12, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> to an old lady like myself, but they were very nice. And but, uh, but you know, it sounded like that kind of situation that maybe they wouldn't respond to that because no real harm had been done. You know, he came in and he left. But yeah, that was real unsettling. Um, you know, for my neighbor and even for myself. And all. Don't misinterpret. Uh, don't get in, in your heads that I'm throwing these things up here trying to blackmail or threaten you or anything like that. But these, I mean, if there's an alternative to staffing up, whether it's this year, next year, three years from now, the alternative is to cut back on the workload. And the only other way they can do that is to cut back on how we respond. So. Okay. Um, well, we'll certainly have that uh, a topic to explore and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking with you more on that subject. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now the time we've all been waiting for, we're going to do a 10 minute break. Let me six, 640 and we'll still be ahead. <laughs> And we have Brian Maleski with Civic Center. And if you can be looking at your questions or see if you got your questions answered. And <laughs> you, uh, you certainly may do what you wish. Uh, Brian, it doesn't look like there's any questions for you right now, so if you want to just kind of tell us what you think are the highlights of things that we need to know or any concerns you have. <laughs> we, um, as you look at the uh, Civic Center budget uh, presented before you, it shows about a 1%, a little bit more than a 1% increase there, trying to hold our costs in line, uh, projecting uh, similar revenues. Uh, 2013, we're projecting to be very similar to 2012. Uh, 2012 has been a very uh, successful year for us so far. Uh, we're uh, looking at uh, keeping the same amount of FTEs. Uh, basically, what you're looking at in front of you is a, a budget very, very, very similar to what uh, you have for 2012. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions? Mr. Nordstrom. Sure, I'll lead it off here. I will take a chance and see what happens. 
see if this would generate some other ideas. Mike, Mike, Mike uh, again, is just an overall general question for Brian uh, um, on the expansion part of it. Just thinking out loud, and I've never approached anybody else on this idea or anything like that. Um, so I'm just thinking out loud here. What would happen if if uh, a contingency, and I'll even include myself in that other contingency, to come forward with another request for another economic development uh, impact? Uh, so it would be I'm going to say an independent study. What would what would be the um, uh, initial reaction number one, and then if I came to you uh, for a little assistance on the funding for that uh, economic impact, um, I just look, look, look for a little reaction from you. Thank you. The council obviously can, um, uh, you know, as a council member, you can fund uh, as you see fit. Uh, the Civic Center spent, uh, I think, about $48,000 on the economic impact study that we did uh, from AECOM. Uh, and AECOM is uh, the same firm that uh, did the Sioux Falls economic impact study. So the uh, background for AECOM is uh, they're one of the largest firms in the world, and they do these uh, in quite a few places. And uh, uh, we feel comfortable with the uh, information that they provided. So, Yeah, I, uh, I've just had a, a few examples of people uncomfortable with the AE uh, COM report or ACOM report and um, I, I guess right now at this stage I'm just thinking out loud I'm not advocating anything or anything along that line or finding a funding source yet but uh, I'm, I'm just I'm just getting the, the feedback right now from a few sources that are um, not comfortable with the uh, a ACOM report and that's that's why I'm suggesting this. Okay, um, I know we're dying to ask uh, Brian yeah. lots of questions about the expansion, but if we could keep our questioning to uh, this year's budget, and we'll have plenty of time to ask him other questions, that would be good. Uh, Alderman Lewis. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. On item 4250, repairs and maintenance, we show a $58,000 increase for this year, a request for this year. If you could please explain to me what that would be for. Thank you. If you uh, don't mind, uh, Tracy Heitch, Assistant GM in charge of finance, is going to answer that question. Thank you very much. Uh, the repair and maintenance is a factor of the, the age of the facility we have seen. We keep records, obviously, for multiple years, and that's an, unfortunately one of those factors that continues to increase pretty substantially percentage-wise as we move over the course. I think we took a look at the last eight to ten years, and it, it was a substantial increase each and every year. Um, one of those things is trying to prevent as many issues as possible, but obviously uh, with the age of the facility, we're going to experience, continue to experience those increases. Excellent. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you, Brian, for coming. Thank you. Just don't mention GA, GA. <laughs> okay, let's see. Parks and Recreation. We got. Lon and I'm sorry, sir. I don't remember your first name. Doug. Doug. Doug okay, Lowe great. is our recreation division manager. I'm Lon Van Dusen, uh, interim or intern Parks. Intern. Yeah, <laughs> intern. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, Madam Chairman said, no, there, there's no such thing as a dumb question, but I know she can't vouch for the answers. So. <laughs> <laughs> but not, uh, we, not, not your, am I answer? <laughs> that, work, that works both ways. Um, now, we, we realize that you are kind of put here under pressure, so... Uh, no. Let's see, I think we have uh, someone have a question to start with. Uh, Alderman Lewis. Hey, thank you very much. I uh, just recently had the pleasure of being appointed to your, your, your committee, and I really appreciate the work you folks are doing. Quick question for you. It was brought up um, at, at your last committee about 
watering for LaCroix links, excuse me, LaCroix, yeah, LaCroix links, right? Uh, that we're subsidizing that currently for money that could be spent probably on the Meadowbrook Golf Course, improving that, is that correct? And could you kind of maybe, for the benefit of the others here, kind of explain what we're asking for here? Okay. Um, Doug Lowe, uh, Recreation Division Manager. Uh, what we have right now at LaCroix is we are funding uh, LaCroix's water at uh, $30,000 $30, a year. This is uh, per an agreement that was signed with the contract with uh, the YMCA um, for taking care uh, or taking over LaCroix Golf Course. Um, the current contract with uh, stipulations of being able to add a few years um, on as long as the contract and the, and the agreement's going good could last till 2031. That's what the contract was signed through. Um, where that money comes from is comes out of actually executives development fund and what ends up happening is when executive loses money then they take then we look at taking money out of the Meadowbrook development fund to offset that loss so in retrospect what ends up happening is for the most part we take thirty thousand dollars out of the Meadowbrook development fund to pay for that water okay um, and anybody else have any questions for I'll, I'll yield the floor if you have any other questions I have one other question uh, Alderman Go Sasso Go ahead. The uh, <clears throat> the restaurant, uh, looking at that, and uh, I guess some of the options that uh, are available right now, what is the cost that you're looking at for running the uh, restaurant is about three, was it 387,000? Mm -hmm. And that is running um, the restaurant as a year-round facility. Um, there's other options that are out there where we could run it as a seven-month facility. Um, not running it during the winter time so it runs with the golf season. There's an option out there of um, being able to run it just like a concession stand and not really running it as a restaurant. Um, but the budget that you have before you is running it as a 12-month um, bar and grill. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clayton? Um, Lana, I guess we just need to start this discussion. Um, Lon certainly knows, and, and most of the people on the council probably don't, but I, my first foray into city government uh, was gaining a seat on the Urban Wildlife Committee after basically throwing rocks at the program to remove deer from the city. Um, I've gone through it with a fine-tooth comb, and forgive me, I, I didn't bring any of my paperwork, but in the plan for deer removal in the city, it says that the city council will set the fee, the per deer fee. It's currently at $65. And I, I don't know who to direct the question to, certainly not you, Pauline, it would have more to do with pay, but we're not paying that $65 per deer as a fee, we're paying it as full-fledged pay. So out of that, or along with that comes FICA and benefits and all those other things. So instead of $65, we're actually paying $78 per deer. Using those figures, last year there were 200 deer killed in the city. It, would, it took 21 trips for the two sharpshooters to go out there and, and remove these deer, assuming eight hours. And then these are guys who have a full-time job. They go out after hours. So assuming that they took eight hours on each one of these trips, it came down to the point where we were, we were paying them as a city $45.96 an hour to go out and kill deer. Um, I'll just be candid and say I think it's ridiculous. Um, it, it's way, way too high. It shouldn't be paid as pay. Um, and, and I don't mean to throw you at, at all under the bus, Lon, but if there's something <clears throat> you can say, I, I know you've got your own feelings about that program, so uh, I, I'd like to hear your feedback in terms of what we are paying, the, the success of it, uh, e even the reason. Um, we've, we've gone 16 years, I think, is, is the, the figure, and we've never had a stated purpose for why we removed deer from the city. And that, that's only begun to be formulated as of yesterday when John Conta, the uh, game biologist for Game Fish and Parks, 
uh, gave us the beginning of a purpose statement so that uh, we as a committee will be able to put together some meaningful plan. And Lon, uh, let, me, let me turn it over to you and, and forgive me for it. Yeah. But, you can hit me, late. you can hit me later. No, uh, you know, I agree with you. I think it's time for the, the committee at least to propose a purpose or a, a reason why we're doing it other, you know, other than I guess in the past what we've been justifying it by saying, you know, the citizens of Rapid City uh, through a, um, a ballot initiative asked the city to, to have some kind of a deer management program. And we did work with the state game fish and parks and trying to, trying to develop a program taking the <clears throat> recommendations from the, the deer committee that was uh, put together in 1995 and they you know put together some pros and cons about relocation and trapping and you know looked at uh, various different methods and techniques for managing the deer <clears throat> and we kind of we we I guess the council settled on the the bait and uh, uh, the, you know uh, the bait and shoot method for that and uh, and honestly I would say the the cost per head that goes to the sharpshooters uh, uh, maybe was somewhat arbitrary, arbitrarily set, you know, because we didn't really know how to how to establish a fee for that, <clears throat> and because uh, they they all started out. I think we started out with a dozen sharpshooters in the inception of the program. Um, and they were all city employees at the time, and uh, we wanted them to be employees of the Parks Department where they were conducting that program. So that's how the, you know, the salary schedule was set up at that time, and of course we had to pay, pay benefits on, on, that, uh, on those salaries as well. <clears throat> now, I can't, uh, I can't say for sure at, th at this meeting uh, how many hours are, are, are spent out there um, with this program? I know there's some nights they go out and you know don't uh, uh, harvest any deer, or maybe one or two, and some nights where they might do ten or twenty. So, <clears throat> so that that part of your uh, um, your question, I, I'm not sure that I am comfortable enough to answer as far as what we. Pay, you know, how you would prorate that per hour that they're out there working, I guess. That's, that's I, fair. I, that, I, that I don't know for sure. I just, um, I, I was trying to find some meaningful measurement for what apparently had been decided upon by a council, I, I'm guessing, years ago. And I don't think the numbers have ever been looked at again. Uh, I was the one who requested a, a spreadsheet of sorts. Um, and it looks like, you know, in total, we've spent $346,000 to remove deer. Um, what little bit of informal studies have been done, it hasn't done anything to mitigate um, deer car collisions. Um, nobody is keeping track of citizen complaints, so we don't know that uh, we're, we're satisfying anybody by removing these deer from any parts of the city. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that certainly need to go into a plan where there needs to be a, a single focal point for entertaining complaint calls uh, if in fact that's going to be a reason to remove deer, but uh, it, it got expensive to the point of about 11, well, I'm sorry, <clears throat> for a five-year period th those calls were counted. There were uh, 108 calls, it seems to me, over a six-year period. It, it averaged out to 18 calls per year, and at 18 calls per year we were spending about $1,300 per complaint to go out and remove deer. So this certainly needs to be looked at. I know it's just a drop in the bucket when we start talking about a $135 million budget, but it's just one of those things that's gotten away from us. Uh, the fingers pointed at the council for setting the fee. Um, why it's paid as salary and not a fee is beyond me. I don't think that's right. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to be part of the solution, so I, I, I've asked to remain on that, on that committee to, to continue to work this. Um, but in the meantime, it, it needs to be looked at, certainly. Okay. Uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. Oh, and if, if, I'm sorry. Should we, well, I was just going to ask if we should put this on 
um, you know, for future. I don't like know that I there's a line need... item here where we can even see it, right. but it's Do one of those things that if we as a. What is set aside for the deer management program or. There is a line about. item for deer management, but the bulk of the money that's spent on the program actually comes out of 4110, the salaries line item. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I think, okay. it, you know, I think we kind of budget kind of a figure of around 22.5, I think, each each year. Um, 22,000? Well, that's going to be dependent on the number of deer. And this year we were down to 200. In previous years it was 300, so it would be one and a half times that just based on the amount that we're paying, you know, as a reward for, for these deer. So mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be up and down, too, a little bit. And then I, I might add, if, if I may, the ballot initiative. And I know <clears throat> people would like to say we, the people of Rapid City, voted to mandate a deer management program the ballot issue, and I went and got a copy just to make sure, the ballot issue was one to support it, to allow it, but not to mandate it. So it's two different schools of thinking. It doesn't say we have to. It just says we can if there's a need, and the need has never been addressed. Okay. I would recommend that we probably proceed with, like, this pull it out of the budget part, but that, I mean, that we're, because it's going to be something that will have to be dealt with over time to look at it. Uh, uh, Pauline? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to point out, I'm not sure when that uh, election took place, but even beginning back in 1996, based on the number of deer that was, that was harvested that year, we've never been less than $100 per deer for cost-wise, if you look at the cost versus the, the number of deer harvested. So I'm not sure who set that fee or if that fee's ever really been paid out as that fee, or what the, the process has been to this point, but it's never been at that cost. There were some other, <clears throat> and do you mind, Lon, let me jump in, because and, and Lon, Lon at the end of the year put together a report. Um, it, it was relatively short, but, but very, very appropriate. Um, in answer to what you said, Pauline, in the, in the beginning years of this program, we paid not only to kill deer, but we paid to process deer. And then that deer processing, I mean, we, we're, we're they're cut, wrapped, and frozen, and now it becomes meat instead of just a dead deer. Um, that went away, and now that no longer happens. What, what they have is a program where citizens can opt to take one of these harvested deer, and it's up to them to have it harvested. So it's a little bit of apples and oranges as we as we compare early years to later years. And then not only is there pay to these guys who go out and shoot the deer, but because they use city vehicles, there's city vehicle costs, there was some other personnel costs that were added in there too. Um, so there's several different lines in, in terms of that budget uh, beyond just the fee to shoot the deer. So uh, it, it's something we'd have to look at as a report. Um, I, I know they're out there because Lon's the guy who had to put them together year after year. Um, but but th th there are things in there, certainly, other than just the harvesting of the deer. Okay, so let's just bring that back, and we can decide if we want to defund it for this year or just keep the funding and then just see if we're going to change what changes we want to make. Ryan? So do we want to, I guess, through this process, uh, do we want to be looking at uh, and bringing forward items that we're I think are worth discussing when we're looking at, okay, so uh, let's add the Meadowbrook Bar and Grill on there, uh, just because as I'm thinking about different needs that we have and trying to get us to a point of covering some of those, I think that might be worth exploring. Okay. Do you have us, uh, Doug, did you want to say something? I, I just want to make another comment about um, the different, uh, different ways of running the restaurant. Um, the golfers, us, ourselves, th that's part of the enterprise fund. Neither one of us want to lose money just like subsidizing the $30,000 of LaCroix. So um, our task was asked to come back in September to see if it's even worth running in future years. So I'm glad that you're putting it on there because it's going to be something that we're, as a staff, are going to decide if it's even worth it by September anyway, too. So. 
Okay, just a sec before we get away. Any more deer comments <laughs> or questions? <laughs> no, I, I, I just... I don't want us to go back and forth to different... No, no I was just thinking animal control again, <laughs> throwing that back in there. So uh, even though we're not on animal control, we're okay, on I deer. I think animal but, control uh, is already on our list. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, anyone want to talk about Meadow Brook Golf Course? I mean, the, the bar and grill before we... I'm just trying to... <laughs> <laughs> we could be bouncing back and forth. Okay, so uh, Mr. Lewis. Thanks. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but uh, and I didn't get to finish up with my question. I guess I should have. We, we've taken the thirty thousand dollars out of the uh, Meadowbrook golf, golfing fund, or correct, correct me on the term. De development fund. Development. Thank you. Um, so, are we neglecting the course in that regard then too? And, and are there things that need to be done in the course? That are are there anything in this budget? That's being done this year to upgrade the course to make it more playable, get, increase the playing time, and therefore, therefore increase revenue. Are we losing revenue? I guess. Um, basically, when you take money out of the development fund, you're you're taking thirty thousand dollars of operations. Whether it's buying new equipment, putting new seed, new things that we could do the green. So, anytime there's money coming out where you're not getting anything back for it, yeah, it's hurting you. I'm just do we need to discuss? Can we add that? To, well, I'm just wondering if we should add that to our discussion as far as the trying to supplement the thirty thousand dollars. The water. Somehow. Do we have the water? The water on is that on there? Okay, thank you. See, Madam Chair, just so yes. you are aware, one of the conversations that Doug and I have had is if this is something that should be funded strictly from the general fund as more of a community investment type fund, where we would pay the water bills through the through that process versus taking it out of the golf course enterprise fund. Okay. I was going to ask Mr. Roberts if you know when that task force is going to be meeting again, or the, hopefully the end of the month we'll set another one up. And I was going to say that some of this stuff is going through the resident or through the recreational watering task force. We'd like to combine a lot of this money back into, if not all of it, back into the general fund, where it's more appropriate to be at rather than coming out of these enterprise funds. Um, but that's not the question that I had. So, okay. but I am going to go back to the Lacroix. Doug, can you give us a little background of where we were on LaCroix before it went to the YMCA? Because I know we were losing more money than $30,000 a year. Yeah, um, LaCroix was losing about 80000 a year before the Y took it over. And then when the y, y took it over, um, we started off paying not only the 30000 in water, but also like 15000 or something in equipment and some other expenses. And then... That contract ran out. That that part of it came off, and then um, two years—I think it was two years ago, or maybe last year even—Mr. Um, Cole and and Mayor um, Hanks um, signed an agreement with uh, the YMCA to extend their contract out. They had a um, a grant that was coming due that they needed extended. Um, extended out period of knowing that they were going to have the course under the YMCA and that contract was negotiated it, and it came through council and it came through all the proper channels but um, and that's when the uh, it was a 16 year agreement with three five year extensions I think one more thing I want to touch on here real quick is the fact that uh, the YMCA is paying for upgrades on the the uh, sprinkler systems out there, the irrigation system out there right now. And when that is in, is there any anticipation for what the watering charges will be after that? Is it going to decrease? Have there been any? There hasn't, there hasn't been any um, research done into that, um, what the efficiencies would be if they're changing out the sprinkler systems and updating it. There hasn't been any. Any work done on that? No. Just I, I, I think I, I see where you're going with this, Chad, and I appreciate that. But I think that if we get into where we're going to pull thirty thousand dollars a year worth of funding and end up getting the Lacroix back, if we were losing was eighty thousand back I, I there, I wasn't going there with that at all. I was trying to say is there's a different way to fund. And we are looking at I know, that. But I mean, right I don't, no, I'm not by any means saying that we should give it back to the, or take it from the Y. By no means. I'm saying it's coming out of the Meadowbrook. There's money that can be used to be improved in Meadowbrook right now. There's some other way we can fund it 
so they can improve Meadowbrook. I'm not saying we should have any And I think that's all going to be lumped into no, yeah. the. Okay, into but I'm just making sure clear I'm very much in favor of the Y having the Croy links. That's all I'm saying. Okay. So just a different way to fund it. That's all I'm asking. Okay. okay. That's, uh, no, by no means. All right. Well, that's kind of what, what I was getting out of this. So, all right. Thanks, Jen. Thank right. Um, uh, Mr. Nordstrom. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to have a conversation with this microphone um, button anyway. The um, question I've got has to do with the aquatics. Um, the um, That division over there, uh, uh, specifically on the horseman pool, I wanted to thank uh, um, Doug for bringing up the idea of, of uh, the heaters up in that pool for uh, maybe using that for an alternative uh, source or funding a different source, I should say. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for that uh, offer and we'll see if we can't continue moving forward with that. Then the major question that I have on this whole water funding or swimming center questions is if we go on a I'll just say a smooth track and everything is kind of put in place will we be needing to do a, an adjustment to your 2013 budget or will that have uh, an effect in a future budget say for example 2014 or something like like that just just the preparation stages of, of a swim center once once the council is able to make a decision there um, actually, uh, the 2013 um, monies that are from the 2012 are uh, is for the field house, and then the 2014s for one of the pools, and 2015s for one of the pools. That's how the money is allocated right now um, in the process. So I would say that the if the process stayed in that order, we probably wouldn't need any more money to fund any of the pools till probably 2015. Thank you. That addresses my question. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Sasso? Just wanted to clarify, um, as uh, Richie alluded to, Doug's uh, looking at um, uh, a change and being able to allocate a CIP funds, and I, I think that was very impressive looking at the potential that Horseman would be rebuilt and looking at a need and offering that the funds for that up. Um, I thought that was really good because otherwise sinking money into something that is hope, hopefully going to be rebuilt uh, would have, everybody would have been looking and saying, what do we do? So anyway, thank you though, again. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I would just, um like to say that I think we are we official on that August 30th date yet, Pauline, for Horace Mann for a special meeting? So we might have to get creative. Okay, because those first dates in September weren't good for a lot of people. So, um, okay, well, stay tuned to your email. You might have it go to your phone, just if it comes from me, you'll want to read it. <laughs> okay. Lon, did you want to say something? I want to make a couple more comments. First of all, I appreciate your time listening to us. And, and uh, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, Councilwoman Doyle, one of her questions was, she kind of prefaced it about were there any significant events that changed our budgets, and I would say, uh, for us, the two biggest things that have influenced our budget the last this year and next year is going to be the Mountain Pine Beetle program. So I, I do you know, want you to keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to present a, a kind of a summary of what happened this year and and some recommendations of how we'd like to, you know, continue with the program if we do. And uh, so that's that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Doyle. Lon, do you have that, where do you have that budgeted for in the 2013 budget? Well, we have a, uh, we, 
Uh, we have now uh, 19 separate budgets in Parks and Recreation Department, and we established a, a uh, uh, urban forestry department now, which uh, has our urban foresters' salary in it, as well as 25% of six of our Parks Department employees <laughs> if, if you, to, to help with that mountain pine beetle program. Now, if we do not utilize those six employees for the mountain pine beetle program, we will likely hire at least a couple of seasonal employees to do the uh, inspections. And we'd like to start those inspections very soon, probably in September, no later than October, because we don't want to get out there in February like we did this year. It's, it's just way too late to, to inspect 3,000 properties in, in that short a time. In the consolidated version? Where would that be? Like in just? It would be under the general fund but section. Yeah. Other programs, professional services. Um, where would you it, would, it would be split up amongst many line items. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anything else you want, gentlemen? Okay. Well, thank you for enlightening us tonight. And let's. For your time. Sure. Let's see, Mr. Barber. Any questions for community resources before Jeff uh, gives us some highlights or about his concerns? Uh, Mr. Laurenti. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just had a question because I saw GIS uh, fell under this particular area. And I wanted to ask you, is there, this is just a general question about the GIS area, but is there a, a preference when the city is needing GIS services or a preference or uh, I assume we do it by RFP, most of our GIS services? We do what? Excuse me? Most of our GIS services are, are done through RFP process or? We have a uh, GIS division. It, okay. has, it has three employees, three FTEs. Okay. Uh, it's partially funded by the city of Rapid City as well as Pennington County. Um, variety of services as far, as far as helping emergency services, mapping. Uh, Rapid Map is the application you're probably most you know, familiar with. Do we use contractors at all for maps and that type of thing that we would do, aerial maps? Aerial photography and that type of thing, yes. We okay, do. so it's contract. That is contracted out. That is, yes. Okay, and do we use local GIS? contractors for that we go out for RFP um, we do tr the last time that we flew was in April uh, we flew the city of Rapid City for aerial photography and we did use Fugro um, they, they did have the best proposal and we did go with them okay I'm, I'm familiar with them as well so that was my thank you very much thank you madam chair anyone else okay Jeff you want to sure um, the community resources department is made up of six different divisions but of a lot of it tends to be very service oriented uh, with IT, HR, GIS, uh, risk management, code enforcement, and uh, community development. Uh, we don't have a lot of the big capital expenses that some of the other departments have. If you take the interdepartmental charges out of it and you just say what do we actually spend in our department, it's about $3 million a year. And about 1.8 million of that is on salaries and benefits. So, so it's a lot of service. Both Our customers are both um, the public, uh, like in HR, for example, as well as other city departments, um, you know, that uh, IT, for example, would, would serve, as well as HR, obviously, would serve um, other city departments. So it's really a service-oriented um, department overall. Uh, we spend a lot more money on uh, salaries and benefits than any other particular line item. The only larger capital expenditures we do have um, are generally in the IT uh, division. One of those Pauline mentioned, we're planning on $150,000 of IT's CIP money in 2013 to put toward the IFAS replacement. Um, that should be a fairly large project. IT's role in that, uh, you know, IT will have a fairly large role in that replacement, obviously. Um, the current IFAS system, besides being frustrating at times for end users, it's not very solid as far as um, the way it runs on the server, and city employees are used to getting a couple of emails every week from IT that this, the server has to be rebooted again. So um, that's a consistent problem that, that we need to address with, with the new system. Um, 
Pauline had mentioned that committee will meet again on Thursday, and I have I will um, be on that committee, and I'm sure of the new IT officer that we hire in the next couple of months um, as, as a replacement uh, for the gentleman that left uh, will probably serve a fairly prominent role on that committee as well. Um, code enforcement is one of the divisions that probably gets the, the most uh, attention in our department. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in code enforcement in this 2013 budget is you'll see a, there's a capital outlay of $20,000 um, in our department. That is to replace a vehicle that one of the officers drives on a daily basis. We are replacing a 1995 uh, Chevy pickup in 2013 that uh, has officially its useful life is spent, I would say. So uh, that, that'll be uh, exciting for that division. Another large... <laughs> Yeah, um, that's a, that is a that is a tight budget. You know, people like to talk about uh, code enforcement and the the, the need for it and uh, how proactive they'd like us to be. But it, that is really a tight budget. So um, we uh, we do the best we can with what we have. Um, another large variable that we have every year in our department is the community uh, development block grant money. At this point, uh, we have a number in there for. 2013, but we really don't know what it is. Um, it's one of the things that when Congress has their budget uh, hearings every year, they threaten to cut it drastically. Uh, so far, they haven't done it. Um, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. That's something that we wait. I believe we got our award letter in January last year um, because that year runs April 1 to March 31 uh, for the CDBG money. So we'll have to uh, we'll have to wait and see. Part of the issue with that is that we are allowed to use 20% of whatever that grant allocation is to administer the program. So that pays some of the salaries in community development. Uh, we'll have to see exactly what that number comes back as, what the grant is, what 20% of that number is, and then we may have some issues um, with, with staffing levels in community development, what we're able to do um, as far as funding those positions. So it, it's just at this point, it's an estimate um, that's a variable that we can't do anything about at this point. Alderman Nostrum. I've got a question for you, Jeff, and probably even more so in the area of Barb Garcia, if she is here. Um, thank you. Um, just uh, to be a standby. Um, the uh, question will have to do with demolition of houses that are uh, in the area of being condemned. And I, and I apologize, I'm not seeing that line item in there. Do we have that in our, within your budget, in the community resources budget? We do. At this time, we have a $25,000 uh, allocation per year for demoing houses. Um, the fund itself actually has, I'm not, I don't remember the balance off the top of my head, we budget 25000 a year. The, the fund itself actually has considerably more money than that. Part of the issue with demoing houses, and I won't pretend I'm an attorney, but is the, the long process and the due process that a homeowner is allowed before that is allowed to happen, um, I think is more of an issue than funding. If we actually get to the point to demo a house right now, I think we can fund it. And um, so if I'm understanding the numbers correctly, at the current rate, we would be able to demo about two houses a year? I think that'd be pretty close, yeah. I may have some other questions, but thank you. Uh, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Come on. This is the second year in a row I've sat on this side. I think the, the ward mate from, the junior ward mate should have been sitting on this side so I could look at <laughs> you. <laughs> Jeff, uh, I just wanted to know where we were at as far as the, the um, in-vehicle computers for our uh, code enforcement guys and, and their new technology for them to make their jobs a little easier. Because if you look at those numbers, you're looking at roughly, oh, 1,100 or so calls per person a year, or not calls, but uh, inspections per person. Um, and you know, I have to give them credit for doing a very difficult job because I know in in my specific neighborhood, they are not the most liked people in Rapid City. So just let me know. I'd just like to know where we're at as far as technology for them. That happened in, in 2012. It happened this year that we funded laptop computers. 
um, and mounts for them in their vehicles. So um, I think that, that they really like that. I mean, the, some of the, the things that they need to look up um, as far as internet, internet access and database access um, that they can do in the vehicle without having to return to the office um, nearly as often. I, I think it makes them much more efficient and I think they really appreciate that. But that is already funded and those are already operational. Thank you very much, Joe. And you are correct, uh, you know, code enforcement officer, when you think about every single complaint, you've got somebody, that, usually some of it's proactive work, but when you've got a person that made a complaint and the person that was complained about, somebody's going to be upset with you mm -hmm. on every single transaction. <laughs> so, um, and sometimes both of them. Yeah, yeah occasionally. <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> Anyone, um, uh, Mr. Sasso? Just uh, again, the with the funds for de demoing approximately two houses per year, uh, how many have we demoed on average? I guess just last time we demoed, it's been a long time. Yeah, so a couple of years ago and we did two houses then and we keep budgeting 25000 a year, but I know like in 2012, I don't believe we have any plans to use it at this point. I don't know that we have anything that's close enough in the due process to allow for it this year. Do you want to expand on that because it might Barbara, answer some that? other the, questions? That the abatements that we the abatements come out that we do for um, grass and weeds and stuff, Barbara Singh, come out of that same account. I didn't realize that. It all comes out of that one account. So all of the snow removal, grass, any abatements we do for miscellaneous garbage, all of that comes out of that twenty-five thousand. That year we did the two demos, we almost went over the twenty-five thousand. Luckily, it hit right at January, so we. That has covered it up until now. Um, there is significantly more in the account that we could ask for a supplement on, and it was 123. So there's plenty. If we could get the approvals to demo, we, we have the money. Uh, I have a question about that. We're, um, um, we're on a committee for looking at substandard housing about what to do to increase code enforcement and all. Was this money, could it also be used like to board up houses? Or it, does that have to come out of something else? We have used it, it it, yeah, it has been. Okay. For that on a couple of occasions. So I would just say because of our work on that committee, we're hoping that we will be able to be more proactive and we'll actually be using that money <laughs> to, to help neighborhoods get stronger. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom. Uh, switching to another division within uh, community resources, the IT. Um, Jeff, have you got uh, or maybe it, maybe because we don't have a director in that position right now? Um, have we got some maintenance plans for our software, some software real realignments uh, that we have to do, or purchasing new software? So. Um, we're just keeping everything rolling along as we are right now because I know some of our, I think it was alluded to earlier that some of our software is expiring um, or running up to a deadline and we no longer can maintain it. So um, are, 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 is that in the IT budget uh, planned right now? Do we have a longer range plan for the IT uh, software maintenance? You know, the software maintenance is, a, is an ongoing process um, for IT. The software that we use specifically is more, uh, that IT pays for is more on server side uh, type, you know, type software programs. When you're talking about like a point of sale system for the parks, or you know, for parks and recreation, for example, that would come out of their budget, not ours. We would be involved in the, uh, you know, to, to help them install, but, um, and to maintain, but they would be, they would pay for that. But we do have ongoing maintenance, obviously, of keeping our, you know, our servers and our infrastructure, um, you know, and keeping that all maintained and in good working order. And, and I think the IT budget uh, for 2013 is appropriate. The, like, city 150,000 that Pauline was talking about that we're going to pay toward the IFAS replacement, that's going to come out of IT's allocation of CIP money for 2013. 
and that that will be a major project. Um, the IFAS, because of, you know the general administrative and financial side of it, it touches everyone in the city. You know, if nothing else, on the purchasing side, anytime we enter a purchase request, it goes through that system. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Is, is this another area, and I'm not sure if you're the right person, Jeff, again on this question, but is this the area that we're going to be discussing about uh, interdepartmental charges? Uh, Jeff gave a good example about what uh, point of sales uh, issue could be, and, and our IT people are serving that, uh, servicing that. So, this does that fall into this area of interdepartmental charges? Well, you're right. IT, for example, at this point receives a lot of interdepartmental charges because they charge other departments for their services. But, for example, what Pauline's talking about doing by eliminating general fund to general fund. Right now, I believe IT charges the police department about $200,000 a year for all of the um, services that we provide them. If that, if general fund to general fund goes away, then if PD's budget comes down by $200,000, IT's will go up by $200,000 because it's a balance. And it, you know, maybe it's a better idea that that way you'll see what you're actually spending your money on, and you'll know what IT actually costs the city of Rapid City. So I'm not against doing that at all. Um, it, it just will change, you know, it, it will change the budgets. And, um, within my department because we do receive a lot of interdepartmental charges. They think that's a good argument for it, for uh, removing it. Um, thank you, Jeff. I'll yield the floor. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank you, Jeff, and <coughs> all your supporters for thank staying you. late. Okay. Um, Compass. Huh? Kellen. <laughs> Hi, Kellen, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Kellen off the top of? For he enlightens I'll, us on I'll his uh, needs or concerns. Go. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Doyle. Um, just to let the, the council know, the entire Compass program budget for next year was a, an unbelievable stab in the dark. Um, not coming from that field, that profession. Uh, Kellen definitely straightened us out when we hired him. And we're continuing to make adjustments. However, Coming in when he did versus when the budget numbers were being prepared, there is a shortfall. So I can tell you right now that we will, um, not today, but we will be coming to ask for um, $49,105 to make up the difference in where we're at versus what we need for next year. And that's factoring in, um, we, we haven't hired the, the support staff yet. We don't know if they're going to have dependents, you know, to, uh, be considerate for benefits, salary, et cetera. So there are some other issues to um, maintenance on the building that wasn't considered when we when we did that. So if you have any other um, more specific questions, Kellen's definitely the numbers man to ask, but um, just to prepare you for next week, we definitely will be asking for that. Thank you. And since the Madam Chair has left, we'll go to Chad Lewis. I don't have a question. Why'd you hit the button? I was trying to turn it off so you wouldn't be speaking anymore. Does anyone have questions? <laughs> Move. Yeah. Any questions for Kellen? <laughs> okay, then we'll reframe. Kellen, is there anything you would really like us to know heading into um, this next week and a half as we kind of pour over the things that we're, we're learning here today? Well, I have provided the Compass Committee, which includes... Um, our two council members, Councilman Doyle and Councilman Roberts, uh, with a more detailed breakdown so that they can share that with you uh, during the process regarding some of the areas that were significantly either missing from our budget or underfunded. The three big areas that I wanted to address in, in our budget was the fact that we are under some significant training requirements to follow the standards that are set out for us by the federal government and required by our ordinance. And so we needed to beef up our training budget for next year. We will try and use, <clears throat> excuse me, as much money as we can this year out of our 
relatively generous budget to get some training, especially for the new staff auditor. Looking at the potential candidates that I have, we will be needing a lot of training to bring these individuals up to speed in the areas of operational and compliance auditing. We do have some very strong financial audit candidates, but lacking in other areas. So we're, our intent is to use as much as we can this year out of our budget to offset the need for significant training monies next year. But we are under an 80 hour per auditor every two year requirement. So our ongoing training needs will be similar to that of the attorney's office. Secondly, it is generally accepted in the auditing community that one of our standards being auditor competence, we have to have appropriate backgrounds, education, and abilities in all areas of audit. If we find that we engage in an audit project where we have some significant shortfalls but need to complete the audit, we have the ability under our ordinance to hire some outside consultants or some technical experts, and we had no money funded for that for the next fiscal year. So I have added some money for that. So our three big areas of concern were training, uh, contingency money if we needed some outside technical expertise, and then the fact that we do have a building that we are responsible for and we had no contingencies built in for that. And I've already had an air conditioning issue this year, so fortunately we had the money this year, but it was not anticipated for next year. So if you have any more specific questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Alderman Nordstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question will be about uh, a product. Is there a timetable when we're going to be seeing a product um, coming forward as a as a uh, what presentation or something like that? We'll be seeing something. A plan, a product. Uh, what what? When do we get to see some some information from this uh, uh, division? Or it's actually, it's not even a division, is it? Is it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, yep. Councilman Nordstrom. I'd be happy to answer that. We're referring to ourselves as a program, okay. since there's a whopping two of us on staff. Um, well, there's one now, but we anticipate hiring a second staff auditor. Um, I think the ordinance change will change the title of the program to the Compass Independent Audit Program. So, no, we are not a division or a department. We are. As the, as, the, as the ordinance has set us up, we are an, a program that reports to a committee that reports to a city council. So I look at us as the one and only agency that you as a city council have. Um, in terms of a product, as you know, the end result of all this work will be audit work and audit reports. The ordinance requires us to have an approved annual audit plan before we begin conducting audit work. That plan will be forthcoming at the end of the year to the audit committee and then presented to this council in January to begin our audit year. The committee is discussing and we will discuss at our next audit committee meeting on August the 20th a way to start audit work this fall. So we, we're not circumventing our process but we want to begin some what I call cross-cutting issue audit work that will touch on a variety of issues across many departments and allow us to actually use the audit resources that you have given us for this year. Uh, it does not take two auditors four months to produce an annual audit plan. So it's my intent to get us started on audit work beginning early this fall. But we need a process to do that and we will be discussing that in August and then bringing forward to the council our recommendations as to how you approve this early audit work for us. So you will begin to see work in progress. The difference between what we do and what all the other departments do is that we are a recommending organization. The standards we operate under require that we conduct our work to obtain sufficient evidence before we come to you with findings and recommendations. In order to do that, we will vet all of this through the committee first and then it will come to the city council. So the end result of our work will be reports on findings and conditions, recommendations for improvements. And you should begin seeing those early next year if we are allowed to begin audit work this fall. The next question I've got in is, it has to do with in, interdepartmental charges again. Is it, it, I'm noticing in your line item it's going down. Uh, so is that going to be continuing? I guess I'm looking for maybe Pauline. Is that is man, there? nothing there? Nothing. But. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm on a on wrong line. Sorry. Okay. So we're <laughs> okay. Wrong line. Anyone else have a question? Mr. Roberts? I promise I 
won't make you look bad, Chad. <clears throat> One thing that we have to remember, I think, on this, and I, I, I'm hoping that, that uh, Charity will agree with me, is even if we do add that 47000 in, there's a lot of money that was going to be turned back on this budget. We're way under budget this year. And even if we fully fund it at the numbers that we're looking at right now, it's still going to be about a 10%, a little more than a 10% decrease over last year's budget that we approved. So I think that even with us asking for more money, we're staying well within what we budgeted last year for this. So anyway, that's just my comments. Thank you. Alderman Lorenti. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I had a question about, uh, and, and I don't know if this is premature or not, but it, it seems like it's 30,000 foot level to me, but sometimes I'm wrong. But um, measurements for success, because we know where the costs are going to be approximately for 2013. What are, what are the benchmarks for success for this program? What will we measure? What will be financial impact? Or if you can speak about that. I can't speak about it for 2013 because we don't have a list of approved audits. What our goal is, is to participate in the budget process as sort of similar but yet different from the other executive branch agencies. Once we have a list of approved audit plans, we will be able, we will be able to put together some kind of indicators as to what we expect to get as far as results. So keep in mind, we don't actually, we can't actually make cost savings, we can't actually make improvements, we can simply do the research, provide the evaluation, come up with findings, make recommendations that if implemented, we would expect to see either increased efficiencies and effectiveness or reduced costs. I have one last question, Madam Chair. Along those lines, um, now it's just escaped me. And it was a good question. But, uh, <laughs> oh, actually, um, a lot, when you say audit, I mean, I come from a finance background, so when you say audit, I'm thinking uh, purely numbers and, and finance, but, and maybe that's not exactly what you mean, so I'm going to ask a question on that, but it seems to me, um, is there a, a measurement of, of uh, processes for departments across the board? I mean, will that be part of it as it begins to, as your vision of it? Um, that as it looks at processes and possibly time um, factors and how they, you know, just steps in a process and, and areas where we might be spending time in the multitude of processes that the city has. And that's a great question. I think you've started down a good road with this more performance-based budgeting. Now departments actually have looked at what should be the appropriate outcomes, not just outputs, not how many potholes are filled or how many road miles are built, but actual outcomes against departmental goals. We will look at that in trying to develop the audit plan for next year. Do departments have, some departments have more appropriate measures. Are there, is there a need to look at individual measures within a department? Part of our goal is to conduct the audits that provide the most opportunity for improving city operations and for reducing the risk that city resources are used in an inappropriate manner or wasted or abused. And the presentation that I gave earlier to the department director sort of outlined the process that we will use in, develop, in taking our risk assessment model and employing it between now and the end of the year. We will be looking at a whole variety of factors, talking with all kinds of city employees to get an idea of where should we, as a two-person audit organization, put our limited 4,000 man hours a year. In, and we want to put them into the most appropriate areas that have the biggest return. The problem with this new program is for us, both of us auditors will be coming from the outside. We are not familiar with city processes, so we are spending the next few months getting familiar with that as quickly as we can. So we're going to rely heavily on the departmental directors and their staff to point us in the right direction as to where we need uh, to be looking. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Alderman Chair. Sasso. <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your and for, for the information, and I guess uh, one of the things, if we happen, if we have an idea, like for instance, uh, vehicles and looking at purchasing used vehicles instead of new vehicles and what that would save, the process for us to get that to you would be 
you're talking about input from council members. Yes. Part of our risk assessment model will be to make inquiries of council members and find out from each of you individually what your priorities would be for us to look at. We'll put that all in the mix and see sort of, as I've been describing it, what rises to the top is the most significant. You know, anecdotally, I can tell you there are three or four major issues floating around that are common to many departments, and I hope that those rise to the top and we can start looking at the really important issues here first. Um, we, we also will want to look at, at issues that touch as many departments as possible rather than going in and spending a lot of audit resources, you know, focused on a very narrow area. Those types of audits can come down the road. This is a new function for Rapid City. We want to get the biggest bang out of our very limited resources. So, yes, you will have an input into the process, each of you individually. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> Are you asking me to look at that? or? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it would be more efficient, that's for sure. Um, I have supported this. I think it's a great idea. Um, it's, uh, I know things always take longer than you think they're going to take. And uh, so hopefully by this time next year, we'll see that the program is on well on its way of paying for itself. Maybe not have paid for itself, but that we can see the, you know, that we're going in the right way. Um, and I heard great things about you, Kellen, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Well, and I look forward to working with all of you and getting your input into what we should be doing in 2013. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're saved the best for last. You mean the council? Uh, no, Mayor Quaker. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to meet him or not. <laughs> but he's here to answer your questions and <laughs> uh, does anyone have questions we'll just do it the same way we did with everybody else don't want to show any special favoritism does anyone have any questions for the mayor before he uh, speaks okay mayor you want to tell us what you have concerns about or what, whatever you want to tell us really don't uh, have a lot. I think the thing that probably affects the council the most is, is that the recommendation that Pauline and I made was to decrease council contingency from 200,000 to 150,000. And that may be something that you might want to look at. I think the past track record of the spending of the contingency fund backs up the idea of taking it to $150,000. But I wanted to make sure that that was on your on your radar screen. The other thing is Black Hills Council local governments, they had, re they had been receiving a $30,000 allocation and uh, Pauline uh, worked with them. Thank you, Pauline, to identify what the true costs were and their allocation is going to be approximately 17500 for next year. So that represents a, a significant savings. Um, we haven't been able to determine the save we're working on determining the savings uh, on this next thing I'm going to say but uh, when I when I was elected I turned in the the 2010 Chevy Tahoe to the police department and the police department um, uh, in return gave me or gave my office the 2007 Chevy Impala which I uh, drive uh, only for for city business and only on very rare occasions do I do I take it home that has resulted in in uh, a significant savings we believe but we're we're working on trying to figure out what that is because uh, the the fuel has the fuel was assessed to different places in uh, previous times and so uh, there is a, a line item that started in 2009 for for fuel in the mayor's office or 2008 and for fuel in the mayor's office budget and some of it was assessed there and some of it was still showing up on the, uh, the police department and other places so we're, we're, we're taking a look at that but just so you know that that has resulted in in, in significant um, 
in significant savings. So uh, other than that, there were a few questions that were brought to our attention. One is what proposed events supported the change in professional services from 2011 actuals of 35,000 approximately to the approved 2012 budget of 106. Um, I wasn't sure of that answer and you know, as, uh, as you know the 2012 budget was introduced before I took office. Clearly the previous um, last year's council and I owned that budget in the sense that we, we did uh, proceed with it for the most part but there were some things in it that we weren't uh, aware of. The reason that for that change is, is that in 2011 there was apparently not an allocation to life waste and it is included in the budget for 2012. Do you have anything to add on that? There was actually a budget in 2011. However, the school district did not invoice us for that as they have in the past. We've always had to have something to be able to issue the check with. And so it's not out of the, in my mind, it's not out of the realm of possibility if the school district's listening now, says, oh, we have an invoice, so we need to do that to pay it. And I think that would probably be the appropriate thing to do anyway if they requested it, because it's part of a matching grant for LifeWays, yeah. where the state puts in so much money, the school district puts in so much money, and the school, or the city puts in so much money. So um, I will precursor it with that. And then the other question is, what proposed events supported the change in other expenses from 2000 actuals, 11 actuals of 65,000 to approve 2012 budget number of 200,000? And uh, the answer to that is the council contingency dollar amounts only show up in the budget number and not actual expenditures. So there, there wasn't a lot spent in the, in the previous year. Any Can questions? you, um, how much money is left in our contingency from this past? About. I think all of the contingency is still available for the council currently. Okay. So and we I don't get to add, so we don't get to add that to our new, even after a few years you have quite a party. No, it just gets absorbed back into the general fund cash balance, whatever hasn't been spent. Okay. Uh, questions for the mayor, uh, Alderman Lewis. I'm not sure if this is pertinent to the 2013, but you know, going forward, we kind of discussed trying to get a motor pool together for the, all the city vehicles. And I know we don't, we don't have anything in the 2013, but maybe just kind of, as you would say, put it on people's radar for 2014, trying to figure out if we can get something together to, we kind of, can you mind, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Kind of discussed this before. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up, Chad. Chad and I went on a ride along with Rich Sagan a few weeks ago and we, we rode the, the new Coolidge North and the Coolidge South routes and during that, during that discussion we talked about the fact that he is spending approximately $120,000 or more on mechanics and he's at the, he's at the mercy of, of various um, third parties in order to do that and so he was going to be working on uh, on a uh, on options for taking that in house. The challenge is is that because his his entity Rapid Transit is heavily federally funded, that those those employees would have to be dedicated to the federally funded entity, <coughs> and so there would be an opportunity for sharing, but it would some. We would, it would be something that would have to be uh, analyzed. And there has been discussion over the years on, on doing fleet management. And it, 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 it gets put into the too hard box often because of the startup costs. But I do think that as it relates to rapid transit, that is something that we can do perhaps either as a supplemental sometime later this year or next year or as part of the 2014 budget? Good question. Any other questions or comments? Come on, Laurenti, you don't have any tough questions. 
Where's the stationary fund budget? <laughs> 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 you want me to answer that? I know. All what right. Okay. Um, Ron, you look like you're on the verge of question him. Nope. Okay. He's tired. Now. Okay. Yep. He's I think we. Uh, he wants to second the motion that we adjourn. That's what he's okay. leaning in for. Oh uh, well, you know that isn't part of our process. Is the the adjournment? Um, so. Alderwoman Doyle, do you, um, we had another thing added about a motor pool, a question for future motor pool for uh, rapid transit mechanics. Uh, I guess our plan will be that we will mail out, email out, you know, the categories. If you think of any other questions between now and next Thursday night, uh, we'll be having the investments come forward, uh, fire, public works. Yes, yeah, a lot of time for public works. This infrastructure will be a, a big issue. And uh, so if you have any more questions, then please send them, um, you know, the first of, uh, by Monday, because it's hard for staff to they have their regular job, and then they have to jump through hoops to try to answer questions for us. Any other? Uh, August 9th, I believe that's the next Thursday. Uh, same time, same place. Also, I believe that uh, one of the churches is going to make us dinner Monday night, this council meeting, prior to council. They're bringing um, dinner, and I think again in two weeks after that. So. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that was very generous of them. And thank you very much, and please feel free to call me or uh, email me if you have any questions. This is my motion. Do you need a motion to adjourn? All right. We've had a first and a second from uh, Scott and Robert. <laughs> Where were you, Sasso? I thought you were leaning into the microphone. I, I got Please tend to your trash. Hello. I mean, I gotta throw him out.